Hello. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, how Mrs. Kiefer and I are organizing the U.S. History 2 class. Um, one of the things that we really want to focus on in this class is understanding this overarching question. That is, what does it mean to be an American? And so that is the lens that we are going to use over the course of this year to help frame how we think about the material um, that we're studying in this U.S. History 2 course. So really kind of keep that at the forefront of your thinking as we go through material. We're going to try to highlight that for you too. So our essential question that we're going to kick off all of this learning with is about the 14th Amendment. So what is the 14th Amendment and to what extent does the 14th Amendment guarantee the rights of American citizens? So um, as we think about the 14th Amendment, um, I want to backpedal a little bit and recognize that um, when the Constitution was originally written in 1787, um, it was a document that examined the structure or framework of American government. Um, but after its ratification and, um, you know, inclusion into our form of government, there have only been a total of 27 amendments added to that document, meaning 27 formalized changes in how business is done in the structure of our government. Um, and amendments can vary. Some of you are familiar with them, right? The First Amendment, the Second Amendment. Um, but in reality, amendments are not all equal meaning some may bear more weight than others. And oftentimes that's based on our value judgments of what we think is most important. Um, but I think for the course that we're going to examine, we really need to be grounded in an understanding of the 14th Amendment. Because the 14th Amendment um, does something very specific in helping us as a people um, recognize our citizenship and for us to understand what civil rights and truly civil liberties we have in this country. So I want to give you some background here on the 14th Amendment and help you kind of understand it a little bit more. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the document so you're going to understand that, just how it's set up. Um, we'll spend more time in one of the sections versus all five of them. I want to talk about why um, members of Congress thought it was necessary. And then um, that's a really good place for us to leave off as we start into our unit on Reconstruction. So let's talk a little bit about um, the structure of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment has five sections to it. It's actually one of the longest of um, all of the amendments. And this is section one, and I've done some highlighting here for you. Um, section one is like, ooh, ooh, this is the one you need to know. It's very important. Um, so section one tells us that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. I'm going to stop there because there's a complicated sentence. Um, so if you are born in the United States or you are naturalized, meaning you go through a process by which one becomes a citizen, then you are in fact a citizen of the United States and of the state in which you reside. So you can be a citizen of Washington and or a citizen of the United States, right? You are a citizen of both. I should have said and and not or. Um, so being born here by definition makes you a citizen. The 14th Amendment says that very clearly. So the next part of the amendment is very complicated and one we're going to spend quite a bit of time on. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. I'm going to push pause. So no state can actually create a law that somehow takes away the privileges you have as a citizen. 
right? You have that privilege and a state can't take it away from you. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Push pause. So let's look at that. This is what we call in the Constitution and in the amendment, the due process clause. Meaning this clause, this part of section one, deals specifically with the issue of due process. Now due process is a really important term. So um, I wanna make sure that you understand what it means. Due process means your ability to like go through a system um, um, in our case, the judicial system, where you have a right to be heard and you have a right to make an argument. That's what due process means. So um, section one tells us about that. And then section one also ends with, nor deny to any person within its jurisdictions the equal protection of the laws, meaning a state can't deny you your equal protection of the laws. What does that really translate into? You can't treat me differently than you treat somebody else. And that is what section one addresses here in the 14th Amendment. Um, the other sections speak to additional issues about representation, about senators, about public debt after the Civil War, and about um, Congress's ability to enforce. We want to really live heavily in that section one. So that's why we're going to focus on it today. So I want to talk briefly about the history of the amendment um, and what do we know and what do we don't know. Um, the, the 14th Amendment was proposed initially in 1866. This is a year after the Civil War ends, and it was officially ratified in 1868. Um, so meaning three quarters of the states had agreed that um, this should be an amendment to the Constitution. Um, the intention in the background behind this amendment is really complex. It's kind of a mystery. Um, there's not a lot of record um, uh, by members of Congress on the 14th Amendment specifically. It's kind of all tied into a variety of things. But there's some stuff that I really want us to kind of keep in mind. So I've wrote this, written this as a question. What do you need to know about the era in order to kind of place the amendment in its context? Like what makes this um, an important amendment at the time that it is created? So I think we need to talk about a few things. We need to talk a little bit about post-Civil War Southern states or what we used to call the Confederacy. So Southern states in 1866 were largely held by Confederate governments, which were pro-slavery or at the very least actually were okay with slavery. Um, and just because Southerners um, lost to the Civil War did not mean they somehow sort of shed their um, philosophies and belief systems on slavery and or states' rights. Um, a loss doesn't cause somebody to change their mind necessarily. Um, we also need to remind ourselves that when the South surrendered, they're required to accept the terms um, that the North set upon them. Um, and some of those norms, these requirements that they have to meet in order to be readmitted to the Union, they have to um, adopt practices or create laws that end slavery. Um, that in this case, as we will talk a little bit about, they have to accept the 13th Amendment. It's very important that they do that. Um, and then they're asked or they're told that they need to grant rights or citizenship to freed slaves. But um, many Southerners were really hesitant to do that. Um, and felt very uncomfortable about creating this level of citizenship for a population which they had treated very differently than, um, than others. And so as a result, many Southern constitutions as they are being rewritten, because they had to be rewritten because the earlier constitutions would have included slavery, but many of these Southern constitutions didn't have a whole lot of enforcement behind them. So while the constitution might say that slavery was illegal, um, it didn't necessarily mean that these Southern governments were all of a sudden okay with freeing slaves. Instead, they um, continued in some of these negative practices um, and uh, civil rights violations, as we'll talk about, certainly treating um, uh, people of color as second-class citizens. And so ultimately, there's this big concern that something has to shift, that something has to change. Um, and there's sort of this need for the 14th Amendment to be created. 
Um, it, I think it's also important for you to know that as the 14th Amendment is kind of being talked about and, and being developed, that our U.S. Congress at the time is basically made up of representatives and senators from northern states. When those southern states left the Union and separated and became the Confederacy, it left the North to basically, well, run its own government. Um, and that meant that they were the only ones sending representatives and senators to the U.S. Congress. So these exact same representatives and senators are the ones that are drafting laws. Um, and the um, Constitution says that if you want to create an amendment, one way that you do that is that Congress can write it and propose it. So these remaining members of, of the U.S. Congress that are from northern cities or northern states, excuse me, feel it's really important that they make sure that they create an amendment that's going to protect freed slaves um, and give them an opportunity to have a fighting chance at equality. Um, Southern state constitutions were really hesitant to create conditions of freedom. And um, ultimately, I think what's really important to keep in mind is that members of Congress felt it was important to figure out a way to kind of keep their thumb on these Southern governments. And the 14th Amendment becomes a way to do that. So as we explore the 14th Amendment, I really want you to ground it in this like post-Civil War time period with lots of change that's emerging at the time period. Um, I really want you to think a lot about its intention to create citizenship, to establish that, that if you're born here or naturalized, you are a citizen, and that its intention is to make sure that there is this legal process that happens to people, what we call due process, and that its intention is to ensure that people are treated equally under the law. So this 14th Amendment becomes an anchor for us in this class because it talks about what citizenship really means, right? And, and how that is something that is guaranteed to us by the US Constitution, specifically through this amendment. So I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask your U.S. history teachers. We are more than happy to help.